kick things off here. Okay, just to make sure y'all are seeing that. Yes, we can see it. So, okay. uh, yeah. All right, well, uh, good morning or good afternoon or wherever <laughs> to everybody. Um, so, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some work that uh, I've been doing on problem of, of just what can we really extract from um, phase response curve data, uh, specifically for biological systems. So um, here's a sort of motivation here is that we've got all of these systems um, in biology in particular that we know that they're made up of a large ensemble of oscillators. So in particular, I'm thinking about neural systems here, but like the heart or, or many of other you know, biological organs and things, we know that, they're made, that they, they're made up of some autonomous oscillators that are coupled together. Um, those particular oscillators may be very complicated in their coupling and in their um, you know, detailed dynamics. Um, but we at least know that they're, that they're formed in that way. And in many cases, we're, we're interested in knowing, well, what happens when you perturb this system um, in some way? Um, and can we predict the system response for new perturbations that we haven't necessarily measured yet. Okay, so to, to make these predictions, I guess like, you know, if I was to dream up the ideal data um, from, from my perspective would be that you perturb the system and measure uh, all or some large subset of the individual oscillators phases uh, as they uh, respond to that perturbation and then uh, return to equilibrium or their normal limit cycle. And um, so this data exists uh, in, in you know, select systems, right? But usually you have to sort of break the system to uh, extract it and measure this. And it certainly wouldn't be available for in humans, um, in uh, neural data in particular. So this, this graph here shows uh, a case that comes from circadian rhythms where they were able to extract the area of your brain that drives your uh, body's internal clock that has these each each of the cells has an oscillator and um, trace through a um, marker uh, on each individual cell so you can see that they add this ttx that desynchronizes all of them and then they trace um, the dynamics as they resynchronize right um, and this enables you to do all kinds of cool things if you have this kind of data like infer the network structure or um, the particular nature of the coupling in terms of the coupling function, et cetera. So I guess this slide is like, uh, I'm not gonna talk about that, right? So um, that would be great, uh, but uh, let's say that there are many cases where we don't have that kind of resolution on the data. Oh. So in these cases, we really just have a measurement of a macroscopic uh, phase, right? So in, in these cases, I'm not even saying that we have an amplitude measurement um, as well, like an overall collective amplitude. Um, and a lot of times this will come about through some kind of marker, right, where you're measuring, say, in, um, so this example of the graph here is um, heart rate uh, versus uh, your circadian rhythms, right? So like this is not a direct measurement at all. You get a time series out of it. It has some kind of periodic component that you might be able to extract um, data about the internal phase. And so can we use this kind of data to build predictive models? Uh, and so, you know, my immediate guess if somebody posed this to me was like, well, all you know is the phase. So no, like, uh, that's going to be, that's, that's going to be very difficult to do. Um, but just to, to motivate this so that, so a, a major success story of this kind of approach would be um, the most popular models for human circadian rhythms are based on a sort of progressively souped up Vanderpool oscillator model. Um, and so here's the couple of equations there, but it, but it, you know, it's kind of the standard Vanderpool with a few extra um, special terms in there that, that were added in over the years. And, you know, obviously like this was, this was proposed and it began being fit before we knew any of the mechanistic basis for circadian rhythms. And, it does an unbelievably good job for something that uh, really is just an off-the-shelf limit cycle oscillator. Um, and so you know, this paper uh, by Julia Stone in um, Scientific Reports, they forecast uh, circadian phases in shift workers to within an hour using this, this model. And then this is the Entrain app, uh, which can be used, you know, back when we used to be able to travel 
to correct uh, jet lag optimally. And, and un under the hood, it's using this Vanderpool oscillator model to predict uh, circadian phase. Okay, so my feeling on this is maybe there's something kind of special about this PRC data, right? So, so we've got our macroscopic variables that we're measuring really just a phase. Maybe this is telling us much more about the dynamics than um, it would at sort of surface level. So for this data, um, basically it's just, you know, stimulus response data. So you apply a pulse and uh, you can measure the shift in it. So let me skip ahead here. This is this, the, the data. So say I have a phase measurement here and a phase measurement here. Then here's where I apply some kind of known pulse. It's going to shift the phase, so this would be a phase advance, and then I measure this, this overall change in the phase. And then this would form one of the points in a curve. You would then apply the phase over a variety of um, starting points uh, or you know, input phases, and you can trace out a periodic phase response curve. So just for reference, this shows um, phase response curve data for human circadian rhythms. Um, the green dots are the, are the actual beta there. So they have a, a, you know, three different stimuli, and then this shows different intensities applied at the same phase. But it's all just you know, pulse being applied and then measurement. Um, and so that's all that was used to fit the Vanderpool model. All right, so um, let's see that, you know, if, if we can improve on this or, or sort of capture the magic uh, of that model. And so first thing to do is that I sort of design the PRC data so that I can use it within an automatic differentiation routine so that I can effectively fit parameters. Um, and then we need to, you know, if we're going to form some kind of general model here, we need to choose a black box for the autonomous dynamics and for how it responds to the perturbations. And so maybe the simplest thing you could do here is to choose a neural network for uh, the autonomous dynamics and then how it responds uh, to the external poles. And this is really just using a universal function approximator here um, for the um, dynamics here, right? I mean, so it's a neural network, but really it's just a function approximator. Um, and you know, so the problem here is that that's a lot of parameters and things to be able to model those dynamics. And so, you know, when I, when I attempt this, I do not get very good fits and things um, to, the, to the data. And, and it's going to take a really long time to converge, um, even you know, even if if you were to get it to work. So that would be if we knew absolutely nothing about the you know internal dynamics. But this isn't classifying pictures of cats and dogs or something. It's uh, you know, no much. We know much more about uh, what could be happening here. So what we can do is model it as a. Kuramoto system, right? So now I've got each oscillator. I know the each has autonomous dynamics. It's got some frequency. They're coupled together in some way, right? So we take a first order approximation here, and then there's a perturbation with the phase response curve. And then we can get, you know, our measurement data by uh, extracting the Dido order parameters, and particularly the first order one gives us an amplitude and a collective phase. Uh, and so we can we can take our phase measurements as measurements of the collective phase there. And we can think about how these kind of systems will respond to a short pulse, so like a delta function uh, pulse here as an immediate shift, and then there's going to be some kind of relaxation shift as it moves back to the um, collective limit cycle. And um, so if you, if you work that out, you can, you can find that that's the, the initial shift is the argument of the order parameter just after the perturbation is applied divided by the um, order parameter just before. And so moving to a continuity, so changing our microscopic dynamics over to a continuous system at the assumption that n is large, uh, then we can write that down as a continuity equation. It's going to be dominated by the perturbation around the, the time of the perturbation. We can uh, approximate the solution uh, using the method of characteristics. And then we get this expression for z bar, which is the order parameter just after the perturbation, uh, as a function of the value before plus our phase response curve. And if we expand um, 
our system in uh, this Fourier series, then we can get this dependence uh, hierarchy of the Dido order parameters. So now we can get afterwards in terms of um, Dido order parameters before. We need to close that series off because we don't know the higher order order parameters. And so there's a couple of options there. So for uh, polynomial tails on the frequency distribution, the best choice would be odd Anitsyn. If you have exponential tails or, or a, a large amount of noise, then you can also close it uh, using what we call the m squared odds odds. Okay, so either way, you can close this off and you get this expression uh, for the immediate shift. And we can take this, so notice that, that this diverges as r goes to zero, which is our uh, discontinuity that we can see in the PRCs. So this finally gives us our short pulse model from here. So this should be valid for short slash weak pulses. And so, you know, we can fit these parameters in here, if there's eight of them, to, um, for a, for a biharmonic um, assumption on the PRC. So closing this off is just two terms. You get like eight parameters. And so then um, we can try to fit this to some generated data here. So I took a, a large Kuramoto network and I perturbed it with a negative sign uh, PRC for different uh, pulses. And then we put this in and try to uh, fit the model. And so fitting just that uh, short pulse uh, model to this, we can get pretty good fits, especially you can see that they are better for smaller and weaker pulses, which we, we would expect given the uh, expansion there. Um, so it does pretty well for new pulses as well, right? So as I increase the duration slash intensity of the pulses, um, it does pretty well, but you can see that we start to see it break down a little bit. So this red curve here is I applied a pulse every day for three days or, you know, or three periods in a row, right? And so of course that's going to be a challenge because it's assuming that it's starting from, uh, it's recovered between each pulse, right? So um, we see some divergence and then it gets particularly bad if we apply very large pulses, uh, which we see what's called type zero resetting of the system. And um, the um, macroscopic model is not recovering that given it was trained only on short pulses. The, the real thing here is that even if I try to train it to, to um, systems with type zero resetting, then um, it sort of doesn't do it, it doesn't do a great job of recovering. It has a hard time capturing those dynamics. Okay, so uh, we, can, we can use this to, um, or we can use a new approach here by uh, adding in some, some of the neural nets with, or the neural differential equations, which were uh, sort of too general to be able to, to fit. Uh, we can combine those two approaches in what's been called universal differential equations. So we're gonna have neural networks inside of our differential equations to model the part that uh, we can't work out analytically. Or, or doesn't have a nice closed form solution. So um, our system now will be our small pulse. So our autonomous dynamics, our small pulse dynamics plus um, a general neural network function times our pulse here, right? And so um, now let's fit the model. So, so here's some fitting data. You can see I fit it to slightly longer pulses here um, and it's able to recover that uh, pretty well, but the real test is uh, when you start trying to generalize the pulses a little bit here. So um, here's some um, more general pulses, right? And so, the, and and in fact, this is the three pulse, um, three pulses in a row. So you can see it does a uh, a very good job, except for uh, this region here. It it um, has some error, but certainly much better than than the. Um, neural, either approach taken alone there. Um, and then, so, so this is sort of me trying to break this, um, this universal ODE approach, right? So I'm taking just increasing Gaussian pulses here. So um, for the blue pulse, which is still a relatively large pulse, it does very well. The green pulse, you can see we start getting um, some, um, discontinuities developing in the system. And, and certainly for the red curve here, this is a symptomatic of that type zero resetting where you have a discontinuity in the PRC. 
And so it's still not doing a particularly good job of, of capturing that. Um, okay, so and, and part of that is that, it, that I did not fit. I mean, I showed you the fitting data here. So it, this was not fit to uh, type zero resetting um, as of yet. So perhaps if I do that, then I'll be able to recover that. All right, so um, some future work here would be, um, we need to try some additional approaches for, for how we incorporate the neural networks into the, into the model. For now, I've incorporated them into the pulse, but not the autonomous dynamics. Um, but I think there's an argument to be made that you could um, also model the um, autonomous dynamics using some neural networks. And I think a, an interesting approach that you could use here is to combine this with some model discovery to try to limit those terms um, that you're incorporating in there um, and, and, and try to see if we can recover lower dimensional terms um, from the system. And then uh, there's also scenarios here where you might have some limited amplitude data. I mean, part of the problem that we have with the type zero is that all I have is phase data, right? So it's got, there's the, um, this, this occurs when the amplitude goes to zero, but I have no amplitude measurements for the system to learn on. Um, and so uh, if we generalize this to systems where we have even limited amplitude data, uh, I think we may see even better results. Okay, so uh, I'd like to thank my collaborators there uh, and uh, I'll uh, check the question and answer box for any questions. Thank you very much, Kevin, for the really interesting talk. There are two questions actually already in the question and answer uh, box. The first one from Alan, uh, how much does your model, uh, he wrote that question when you were presenting the microscopic model, uh, how does this rely on the oscillators having more or less the same natural frequency and collective phase? So, I mean, just, Oops. Yeah, so, um, yeah, inherently this, so this perturbation is, is small in sort of all regards there. So like when I'm closing off to get the autonomous dynamics, I'm kind of assuming that the phase distribution is not perturbed super far away from its synchronous state. Um, but, you know, so there's sort of all the same assumption there, but, but there definitely is that assumption inside of just the autonomous dynamics as well. Right, that these these dynamics themselves will uh, not necessarily hold when we perturb off of the off of the system, um, and so the, there's where potentially a role for the neural network in recovering some of those unknown terms in the um, autonomous dynamics as well. Hopefully that was the hopefully that answered the question. Yes, I see some some thumbs up, so it must be. Uh, so the next question is from Jonathan Robin. Don't you run into massive non-identifiability with the universal approach? That is many parameters relative to small amount of data gives non-uniqueness of parameters that fit. Yeah, well, I mean, yes. <laughs> I, um, yeah, that, that's, certainly a, um, that's certainly a concern. I think that, that having the, the macroscopic model included, so I, I think that's like, the, the neural differential equations, all neural networks, I think is, is pretty hopeless in this case. I think, so what I do is I fit the macroscopic model and then I add in the neural network. So it's sort of pre-fit to that. And then um, I, there's a pretty strong regularization on the parameters to try to avoid overfitting um, the um, neural networks. But yeah, I mean, that I think, <laughs> I think I'd be lying if I, if I said it's not a concern with, with this kind of approach. Yeah, thanks. Uh, next question. You seem to have many questions. <laughs> so next one. Thanks for the talk. It's very informative. I'm wondering whether the same approach can be applied using a kernel function on the continuous model to account for distance dependence interactions. Could you comment well, on the feasibility of that and whether the model would be sensitive to including this? I don't know, but that's very interesting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I I don't think I have a definitive opinion on that, but that's, that's, I like that. That's a, I think that's a really good idea. Uh, there is a question from Benjamin Junter. What kind of training is applied to the neural networks? 
uh, what kind of train? So um, the I guess the the fitting. Um, so it's a um, sort of wrapped Gaussian cost function on the phases um, to account for you know so basically a least squares but using a um, circular distribution and then um, the actual so you can quickly compute the gradient so I think I'm just using a souped up gradient descent uh, to to run it. Um, yeah. Christian, would you like to answer the question live? No. Okay, sorry, <laughs> something came up. So two more questions. Uh, how to split the model into analytically, analytically solvable part and the other part that you use artificial neural networks after the reduction? Um, okay, so yeah, for the, so for the first part, it was basically sort of what I knew how to work out, right? So like, I think the brief pulse idea, um, like that's, that's pretty natural. I think that there's definitely some room there for improving this, this approach, right? So if we improve the, the, you know, applied math approach to solving this problem, then I think, you know, that will then um, put less, you know, the more we can take off the neural network, then the, the, the better the, the overall results are going to be. So I, yeah, I mean, I definitely think there's, there's room there for improving this derivation and maybe some, some fancier asymptotics and things um, to, to get outside of that. But, it, but I think it does a pretty good job for those short pulses. I think the, the big challenge for this is going to be, as I showed you, the type zero, the large resetting stuff is going to be, is going to be hard to capture with this, with this model. Because this, what I'm putting in, this is not a good model for that system. And then uh, the second part, sorry, Krezi, what, what was? It was about splitting the model into analytically solvable part and the other part, which is your neural networks. Yeah, so I, I, I guess maybe um, I'm not, uh, if I didn't answer it, then I, I'm not understanding the, the question, so. I I'm, I'm not sure either, but I, I think you, yeah, there's one more and you still have, we still have time. So, um, uh, so your model is deterministic, correct? That's the first bit. And then can we think noise in terms of stochasticity in the same? That's a question as well as it's typed. Well, so uh, you could think of the microscopic model here. Um, so you could add some noise in here. In fact, you know, so, so, um, that would just affect the moment closure that you choose on the, 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 that expansion there. So there's some really nice results. If, you, if it's pure noise and identical oscillators, then you would follow the m squared term there if, it, if it's noise and heterogeneous. So, so you could have some noise in the individual oscillators. But if you're talking about sort of noise in, um, I guess, like the macroscopic level, I haven't thought about that. Um, but as far as the individual oscillators go, um, the noise and heterogeneity can be sort of wrapped up in this term. Great. Thank you very much, Kevin.